Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this, um, I think, a rather good uh, panel. Uh, here we're going we're gonna to be talking about what is, I think, a very important subject. Uh, we out here in this fintech world, we have all these amazing things that are happening, but we also have lots of challenges, and uh, one of those is security and fraud. So today our topic is doubling down on cyber and fraud. Uh, is, is that regulation? Sorry, I'll get that. Is doubling down <laughs> on cyber and fraud regulation enough? And that's a question. So we're going to firstly look at what the fraud and, and cyber challenges are, what regulators are doing with that. And then we're going to look at, at, and then answer that question, yes or no. And depending on that, we have a number of questions we're going to do in terms of what are the solutions uh, to help with uh, fraud and cyber. So I'm now going to turn to, actually, Teresa, all the way over in, is it sunny? It's always sunny in England, right? <laughs> of course, always. <laughs> We're known for that. All right, so I'm going to ask you the first question, and because uh, I think F.S. Isaac is very suited to this question, right? So uh, could you uh, tell us what are the key cyber and fraud cyber threats uh, that threaten the uh, finance and fintech industry today? Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, really what we're seeing across the board globally in any region you're talking about it, it is still the classic cases of uh, phishing, there's malware. Um, we've had a, a really big increase of zero day vulnerabilities, which mean that there are vulnerabilities in your hardware or software that you don't have a solution for just yet. Um, so you have to make sure that you can make do until the patch is ready. And, you know, last year we actually had the greatest number of zero days ever found and we're we're having more of that this year. And we still see a lot of problems with ransomware. Now a lot of the ransomware actors have evolved to do um, two or three different things at the same time. They might attack your public facing websites uh, with DDoS attacks so your customers can't get to them. They might try to steal data and embarrass you publicly. Um, there are several data leak sites now where they are posting your information saying, we have your information and we're going to sell it to the highest bidder. And so there's a lot of issues going on. And of course, third party risk. We have saw in the past few years, especially during the pandemic, several major critical providers that were targeted and, and breached in some cases and, and sometimes used as a way to get to their customers so they can conduct lateral movement um, to get to the customers that are might be a bit of a harder target. Um, in the financial sector, you know, we are highly regulated and uh, we're considered fairly hard targets. So we are looking at our supply chain as a potential avenue for the bad guys to get in. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Teresa. I think that works, right? You can hear me? I know a microphone yes. that works. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. And do you see it getting worse or better? How, how do you see cyber? What, what, maybe that's a tough question. Uh, and, and do you see more like open uh, software? Like, like the Log4J last December was a, a significant thing. Do you see it increasing? What, what, what's the position, do you think, in cyber threats today? Well, I think they're for us, they're always bad. And, and they're always evolving because they keep up with the new technology. Um, the last session we heard was talking a lot about DeFi and the new cryptocurrencies coming out. The threats evolve to those as well. So anytime you have new technology, you're going to have new threats. And, and you know, with the open source software, this is something that I saw the community really getting together and talking about that. You know, we even formed our own um, working group to look at this uh, as a community to, to address the open source threats, because a lot of us do actually use open source software ourselves. And so we do have to work together in order to identify the vulnerabilities and help them get patched as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. And now I'm gonna to turn to our, our regulator here. Banque de France, yep. are we? <laughs> <laughs> so, Thierry, if you could uh, maybe expand on that and how you think uh, uh, cyber and maybe in other areas, I think we touched on kind of Web3 kind of stuff. Yes, of course. Um, I can say that uh, cyber risk and cyber threats are the, 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 the first, the, the, the number one operational risk for financial uh, actors and even more, uh, of course, in the context of the, the, the war in Ukraine. And um, what we can see is that uh, anyone can be affected. And that's important to have in mind. Uh, the Gartner Group, uh, I think, said that uh, there is uh, one cyber attack using uh, malware, using ransomware every 11 seconds uh, in somewhere in the world. Uh, so uh, in this situation, in fact, a cyber risk can, could 
uh, jeopardize the stability of the full uh, uh, financial system. Uh, and in fact, in two, way, in two different ways. The first uh, uh, point is that uh, it could uh, generate a lack of trust in the traditional financial sector, leading maybe to uh, a shift to cryptocurrencies, for instance. Yeah. Uh, but it could also um, uh, undermine the, the confidence in, in innovation. And uh, if you look at uh, fintechs involved in the DeFi, uh, they are quite exposed to cyber risk. And it's in interesting to see that uh, the, the smart contracts in the DeFi uh, has become a, a, a specific target for hackers. And for hackers, it could represent quite a good deal. <laughs> yeah, and I think there is in the whole smart contract, the whole like Web3 we see a lot of here, I think yeah. there is definitely significant it's an area that, and also open source that we're, we're working in. So I think that is, is really good to highlight. So that, that is cyber risk. So that's the first part of our doubling down, right? So uh, why don't you go and talk to a little bit of, about us about fraud, which is your, your expertise. Maybe you can tell us a bit about what you do in, in that area. Sure. And uh, thanks, Julian, for having me here. Yeah. Uh, today it's a pleasure. So in terms of... Um, fraud and the fraud landscape that we've seen evolving. Yeah. Over the period of the pandemic, we've seen account takeover fraud, which has almost surpassed malware uh, across globally as the number one security concern. So this is where we're talking about folks accessing fraudsters being able to compromise people's credentials and then access their accounts and then do all sorts of spurious activity. Uh, we've seen almost a 148% jump over the past two years in terms of account takeovers. And very interestingly, while organizations are putting controls in place as far as account takeovers are concerned, we are also seeing fraudsters now tap onto other vulnerabilities, uh, and this is playing on people's emotions. As a part of the pandemic, you know, markets having uh, inflation and so on and so forth, job losses. So uh, this is where a lot of fraudsters are now looking at what we call in Asia social engineering fraud, where, uh, for example, if it's a bank, then you're talking about a fraudster calling up, impersonating a bank, and letting you know that, hey, your account is under attack, and we'd like to help you move your funds to you know, a safer place. So people who are vulnerable at that point in time, they are taken through this psychological process where they then trust, trust the person who's speaking with them and end up losing a lot of money. And uh, I think the third aspect that I talk about is um, SMS OTPs, which for a long time were considered a holy grail uh, in terms of being able to authenticate users. And we have clearly seen uh, that very much compromised. Uh, and, and we know that regulators the world over are relooking this. So I'd, I'd point those out as some of the key ones, and, and this is how it's further evolving. Okay, thank you. And I, we only have a little bit of time. There's a lot of knowledge here in this space, so I, uh, uh, we will keep uh, it brief. But I think that is, uh, we've, we've, I think, quite well defined what a significant challenge that the whole fintech space has in terms of fraud and cyber. So, what are regulators doing about that today? I'm now looking at the regulator. So, uh, Thierry, would you would you want to go? And then, uh, oh, actually, no, I think we will probably go to Phil first. Actually, sure. Phil, why don't you give a little bit about uh, that space first? Sure. Thanks, Julian. Uh, the waves of ransomware, especially last year in 2021, concerned a lot of governments around the world because there was a really big impact to the economies of the organizations in those governments or the governments themselves. And the governments have quite naturally reacted by trying to protect what's most important to them. Um, what we're seeing in Asia Pacific right now, in Korea and Vietnam and Australia and Singapore, et cetera, is a big increase around critical infrastructure regulation that's coming. Um, Australia actually was kind of novel in this. The recent passage of the Security of Critical Infrastructure Act defined wide, wide swaths of the economy as critical infrastructure, including some technology providers, including cloud providers. Um, and banks are critical infrastructure. Uh, some fintech players are critical infrastructure. And there's increased obligations, there's increased penalties, and there's increased requirements for information sharing, both across the network and with the government. Um, so we see this as a positive thing, um, but these are relatively new types of regulation, so there's still some things to be worked out in a dis discussion through government and industry to really get them right. So maybe just to, 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 to make clear to the audience, what do you mean by critical infrastructure? That's an important term, right? Yeah, awesome. So critical infrastructure typically, or CI, had been things like water, power, transport, and other like infrastructure. 
Um, the evolving definition now is to include digital assets as critical infrastructure, not just critical information infrastructure, or CII, which was a subcategory, but as critical infrastructure itself. Okay, thank you. Uh, Thierry, do you want to talk a little bit about, from a regulatory perspective, yeah. what, what's happening? Um, I would say that the regulators and also the supervisor, because central banks are also supervisors, yeah. <laughs> have to gain to, into um, uh, a better understanding of um, operational incidents in the financial sector. Uh, but also, uh, they have also to monitor, of course, the, the main service provider in the, in the financial community. And uh, another point is that uh, they have to uh, prevent, of course, um, regulatory shopping, regulatory arbitrage uh, between the, the different jurisdictions. So uh, at uh, the European level, uh, in fact, the supervisor and regulator just published a few years ago some uh, guidelines regarding uh, uh, cyber risk and uh, cyber incidents. Uh, and these guidelines was, were, were, of course, for, the, for all the financial entities. And uh, this paved the way to uh, uh, the, 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 the Digital Operation, Operation uh, uh, Resilience Act, the DORA regulation, that is uh, under negotiation at the uh, European level. Uh, it will be published uh, next year and uh, uh, will be uh, used and enforced uh, in 2025. And this uh, DORA uh, uh, Act, in fact, uh, we would provide some requirements to, to, to all the financial actors in different ways. The first one is uh, they would have to manage their risk, their IT risk. Uh, of course, protecting their different assets and mapping out uh, their different IT assets and, uh, uh, and the related uh, risk. And they would have also to uh, manage uh, the IT or ICT incidents uh, and report to the financial authorities in a harmonized framework, I would say, harmonized format. They would have also to implement a testing, an operational testing policy in, 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 their, in their organization. And another point very important is that the supervisor would have a, a, a specific oversight for the, um, the, the critical uh, third-party providers, and including the IT providers in the financial sector. And that, that I think that it is really something new in the regulation that is really, really, really important. Of course, at Banque de France, we welcome this kind of regulation because, of course, it's very transversal to all the financial sector, including the banks, but also the, the, the insurance companies, the fintechs, the market infrastructure. Uh, it is also, uh, of course, quite... Uh, it includes uh, 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 the right level of proportionality, I would say, so it's quite also realistic uh, as a pro uh, an operational point of view. So uh, it could be a, a, a real uh, a strong point to, to establish good rules for cyber, cyber security. Okay, thank you. So yeah, a very complex world. So I think we've covered, we're nearly halfway through the talk and basically we wanted to basically say, you know, what the, the risks are, cyber and fraud, and they're significant. And obviously we have some reasonably significant regulation. So the question is, doubling down on cyber and fraud regulation enough? I think I know the answer, but would we all say no or yes? I would say no, okay. <laughs> not enough. <laughs> I would say no too. Okay. No, not enough. Bill? Yeah, it's got to evolve massively, so let's call that no. Yeah. Okay, and, and Teresa, behind my shoulder. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say it's not the only part of the puzzle. We do have to do a, a lot more together as a community as well for regulatory harmonization and, and, and really making sure that we're not making it overly complex for ourselves. Mm. So, so basically, how do we empower, how do we help uh, the fintech industry uh, to do more, more than doubling down on regulation. So let's focus on the future now, mm. uh, on uh, you know, the cyber and fraud regulation. So what can the finance industry do to prepare and combat cyber threats? And I'm going to start again with, with you, Phil. Yeah, thanks. That's really interesting. Um, I don't want to take like a purely technical view, so I'll okay. talk about some culture and I'll talk a little bit about education and I'll keep it brief. Um, Culturally, when I look at our big banking customers and big banks around the world, I think the one cultural practice I'd love to see them change is the culture and tolerance for risk acceptance. Uh, what we see a lot of times is organizations accepting a base level of technology risk, and that same level of technology risk is causing them some vulnerabilities. 
Um, I happen to work for a big global technology company. That's why I'm in a t-shirt right now and not a jacket. Um, and, and inside of Amazon Web Services and other organizations, we've got very simple security principles, like encrypt everything, like only use ephemeral authentication, and we don't accept technology risks. So I'd love to see organizations out there be really transparent in their state of their internal technology risk, and from the top down, drive that culture to zero. Um, briefly on education, industry and government has got to come together to be sponsoring specifically cybersecurity skills education. In Australia, as an example, Amazon Web Services, the big banks, the cybersecurity agency partner to train hundreds of thousands of students in, uh, in, in cybersecurity at the secondary level. We partner with university to create graduates who understand cloud and cloud security, and we track the inputs, how many students we train, and the outputs, how many skilled people reach the market. We'd love to see Singapore financial services sector, Singapore technology sector, Singapore government really come together and do similar programs. So you see a talent as being a, a, a significant challenge. Th that's a no, whole other 40 minute t discussion, I think. <laughs> yeah, skills are essential in yeah, cybersecurity. And, and just in terms of me, open source security is, is one area that every event I go to, they talk, we need more people who understand this. Because the world's not getting simpler, it's getting more complicated. And, and people, everybody has to think about cybersecurity, right? So let's now go to Thierry. So yeah. what are your thoughts on oh, what we should be doing, right, yeah. rather than doubling down on, on, on regulation? So I explain what, uh, what, yeah. what is happening at European level, but I, I think that uh, all the financial authorities have to exchange information wider, <laughs> of yeah. course, of different uh, uh, parts of the world, and, um, uh, and of course, uh, exchanging information and harmonizing their different frameworks. Uh, this is uh, really important, and maybe I can uh, mention the, the work that uh, has been done at uh, G7 level uh, with, a, uh, uh, um, w with a kind of uh, harmonization of uh, categorization of different IT, IT incidents and cyber incidents. And this work has been, uh, has been done, the Banque de France proposed uh, uh, this kind of uh, organization and with other G7 participants. And now the work is uh, being continued by the Financial Stability Board. Okay. So something is quite, quite valuable. Uh, another point which seems to me really, really important is uh, to go to operational resilience and to, to go to testing and to testing in a cross-border way. That means, of course, you organize a, a cyber resilience test at a world level and uh, also at the G7 uh, uh, level. Uh, maybe I can mention this, uh, this organization of uh, cross-border coordination tests that happened uh, uh, last year. And um, uh, this work, of course, uh, helped to validate the, 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 the response uh, cyber, uh, cyber risk uh, protocol for, for the, 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 the G7 uh, financial institution. And now uh, this protocol can be activated uh, any time uh, in the day, in the week, in the, in the year. So something that is really, really important. And if I may, I think that uh, something is really uh, also uh, important is to use uh, the new technologies to help uh, uh, regulation and, su and supervision, of course, in, uh, in cyber security. This is what we call the reg tech or, or also the sub tech supervision, technology for supervision. And um, it's really, really important for all the financial institutions to innovate. And uh, this innovation helps, of course, to, uh, to be able to, to answer, to react to the, to the future. Uh, threats that, uh, that could, could happen. Maybe two, two, two examples. The first one could, could be, of course, to, to manage all the information that we have, uh, and we have the, the, the capability to use uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, capabilities uh, ju just to, 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 be, to be able to, uh, for instance, to detect uh, unusual or suspicious behaviors in your, in your organization. Uh, a second exa example is uh, uh, the, the, the threat regarding uh, 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 quantum computing, which is qu qu quite, sim qu qu quite in, in the future, so, so, so something quite, quite far in the future. But in fact, the, the, the risk is rising, and um, uh, it's important to, uh, to, to develop some uh, 
protocol, some features to, 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 to react and to be, uh, to, to, to be uh, uh, preserved for this kind of uh, new attacks because, of course, quantum can computing could represent a, a new threat. At Banque de France, we just uh, proceed to uh, an experiment regarding quantum computing and uh, we have a, a publication uh, on what we have done to secure a uh, communication line between our data centers using post-quantum uh, uh, computing uh, uh, algorithm. That means uh, algorithms that are resistant to, to con con quantum computing uh, uh, attacks. So it's a good yeah, example. Well, <laughs> quantum computing is a, is, is, is a big yeah. topic. Actually, maybe, Phil, do you want to mention, talk a little bit? Two seconds on quantum computing, or is that something that you are? Uh, no, I just, I mean, thumbs yeah. up. Post quantum cryptography is super important right now. The yeah. tech is already available, so make sure you're using it today. Yeah. yeah. So thank you both. <laughs> and now let's turn to fraud again, right? So, Loretta, maybe you can talk a little bit about rather than regulation, what else should we be doing? What are the smart things that people could be doing? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Julian. So, uh, I would definitely want to add a couple of other things. So, one is, uh, having organizations move away as, as they are looking at leveraging digital channels, have them move away from porting physical processes to digital channels and intrinsically designing processes that are meant for digital channels. Right? And, and that means ensuring that you're providing convenience to the customer but with the right safeguards and controls and checks in place. So that balance is definitely required. And, and by this, what I mean is, uh, leveraging things like, and this is a layered approach, right? Fraud is not just, the, there's not just one short solution to it. There are, there are layers where they're looking at the device of the user, where they're looking at behavior in terms of the way they, they type, they swipe, they, you know, key in their pin and so on. So uh, while digital transformation is in full force, ensuring that the way organizations are designing their processes, specifically around security, around authentication, and, and ensuring that the customer is involved in this process in a very intuitive manner. That's one. Uh, the other one I would mention, for sure, I completely agree awareness is key. And, and you know, um, strumming up the awareness in terms of simple things, people knowing that they should not be leaving passwords uh, lying around, your bank is never going to call you asking for your credentials, and so on and so forth. But at the same time, while a lot of this information is static, where it's on you know, the portals of um, financial institutions saying, hey, please make sure you're not divulging your uh, you know, user IDs and passwords. After some time, what ends up happening is a lot of this information is static. It ends up being a part of the scenery and is not top of mind recall. And from that perspective, leveraging capabilities which are relevant and contextual at the point of interaction uh, that the customer is going through a transaction. And I'll give you an example. We talked a little bit about social engineering fraud, where you have fraudsters who are impersonating a bank calling you up um, and saying, you know, your, your account is under attack, so we'd like to help you move your funds. At that point in time, being able to leverage technologies, because these fraudsters are playing on people's emotions, on their vulnerabilities, and customers, as they go about interacting at that point in time, demonstrate duress, there's panic. You know, your account is under attack. So the way you're typing is not the same as you would type when you were in you know, a completely comfortable situation. So being able to detect those kind of parameters and then be able to throw up contextual relevant messaging saying, hey, by the way, are you being, uh, is there someone guiding you through a transaction at this point in time? And therefore making customers alert at the point of interaction that they might possibly be in a fraud situation and therefore being proactive about it as against reactive and actually being able to stop the fraud in its tracks. So I think these are some of the things that uh, financial institutions, fintechs can really leverage uh, to keep their customers safe while offering them a great experience. Mm. That's great. I think social engineering is, 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 is and the way AI and others are helping it. So I think there's some great tech that, that, that you talked to there, right? So, so now we're talking about you know, those kind of solutions. So you know, in terms of improving the environment, improving what we're doing. So now I'm going to turn to Teresa over my shoulder again, <laughs> uh, all the way back in the UK. So what can governments, regulators do to streamline regulation like reg tech and ensure it assists companies with compliance and reporting?
Yeah, it's, it's a great question because regulators around the world are trying to do much more in the cybersecurity space. They're much more aware of the cyber threats and trying to get involved on the operational level. But for a lot of us who are multinational corporations, it can make things very complex. It can make things contradictory even. And that's why you do need much more communication between the regulators and not just between the regulators, but with the industry as well. Um, what, what, what was just commented about, about uh, looking at the fraud, um, that's a perfect area for collaboration between sectors, between the banking sector and the telecommunications sector, which is happening in different places around the world. So we always press on communication. Communication, collaboration, those are very much key because everybody's trying to do as much as possible for their own neighborhood, for their own country, um, but they sometimes lack awareness of how that affects companies who are operating across borders, who have cloud providers who operate across borders as well. And that's where we really do need to talk about a lot of the different things happening and, and making sure that we have that level of collaboration. We did start during the pandemic a a forum for uh, the central banks and uh, re regulations and uh, supervisors called the series forum specifically to talk about cyber risks and how we're addressing them and they do talk to each other about what they're doing and you know different things like breach notifications um, sometimes sometimes telling your regulator about a, a breach could vary drastically between each country or each jur jur jurisdiction that you're in even in the united states each state actually has a different threshold and a different definition of what is a data breach so it can make things very complicated and we would love to see much more discussion happening to help harmonize and make things a little bit easier because if you're so busy fighting and trying to deal with the compliance issues, you're not actually fighting the cyber crime that's happening around you. Exactly, thank you. And that actually I, I echoes a lot of things that I hear in, in my, my work as the Open Source Security Foundation is that you know everyone wants to, it, it's, it's challenging. And there is definitely a, a shortage of talent and talent shouldn't necessarily be you know, responding to instant reporting, it should be managing you know, the adversaries at hand, right? So it's, it's, it's a subtle mix between the two. So now we're coming up to like the last five, six minutes. I'm gonna do a quick round uh, for these four and then we may get a question in time, right? So, um, okay, everybody. So this is a, a, a wrap up question. So if you could name one thing companies or individuals could do now to improve their cyber forward security, what would it be? And I'm gonna start with Namrera on the, on the over here. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm going to uh, stress on ensuring that they're using the right technologies which provide that balance between fraud and friction. Okay. Yeah, I think that's, that's very key because you want to ensure that you're keeping customers engaged with the right experience, but you're keeping them safe at the same time. And that means designing the right kind of processes, leveraging the right kind of capabilities um, towards making sure that you keep them safe. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That's great. Uh, when we look at the patterns of attack, we're definitely seeing fewer things that are like server was unpatched and much more things around this username and this password was reused. Mm -hmm. So my recommendation is, and it's slightly technical, use ephemeral authentication or ephemeral credentials. If you've got usernames and passwords that have been unchanged for humans, if you've got access keys to allow communication between systems for machines, and they're old and not dynamic, then you're doing it wrong. Uh, what you want to do is use roles and other ways to federate and inherit dynamic authentication so that there's no credentials, there's no usernames or passwords, there's no access keys left around in an environment. That's super technical, so if you're not technical, just go back to your org, ask your teams, are we using any passwords or any keys that are longer than 30 days? And if you are, start with there and start to fix it. Thank you. Thierry? Um, regarding cyber risk, I think that it's important to protect, to secure your information system, of course. But what is also really important is to be able to react. And uh, to be able to react, you have to go to a very operational approach and a very operational process. And I would say that uh, it's really key to go to uh, operational training regarding cyber crisis in your different organizations. And uh, with this kind of exercise, exercise of course, if you uh, proceed to regu regular exercise in your organization, everyone will be 
able to know what he would love to do if it occurs. So it's really uh, the point which is really key. Okay, thank you. That's, that's great. Um, and uh, Teresa, the one thing? Yeah, I would say, I mean, obviously, um, I'm a little biased being an intelligence person, but you really do need to understand the actual threat landscape for your company and for your community, because I think a lot of people approach it in a very wide spectrum, and they try to do everything at once instead of prioritizing what's best for their companies. And really, that for us, that's a collaboration as well, is knowing that you're not alone, that most times you, you do have a lot of other companies out there that are going through the exact same thing you are. So in Instead of trying to build your own army of staff to deal with it, collaborate and talk to other people who are doing the same thing. That's great. I'm an open source. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So uh, actually, now we're going to take some of your questions. Thank you for the questions. I've got a lot of questions. Uh, so first one is how to tackle cybersecurity talent. Because we mentioned that. How do we do that sustainably? So uh, who, does anyone, Phil, do you want to? Pick up that, or Teresa, or sure. I'll just yeah. use a super practical example, and then yeah. love to hear from others. Yeah. Um, it's at all layers of the educational ecosystem. So we've got a, as a society embedded into secondary, embedded into university, embedded into professional training, and measure that pipeline of talent coming out. Okay, excellent. Because it is yeah. key, right? I see this challenge that we don't have enough talent, right? And also the talent, you know, even writing software, software engineers aren't aren't, aren't trained to do cybersecurity, right? It's, it's, it's just not in the, it should be default in everything that we do. Everyone who writes, you don't just throw it over the security professional at the end. Um, I'm going to take another question. I don't know if anyone wants to answer this because I've always wanted to. There you are, I've got that one there. Does anyone have a view on cyber insurance? Because that's an area that uh, I think it's a tough thing to do. To I would love to talk about cyber insurance, actually, okay. <laughs> because I think I think way too often people yep. use cyber insurance as their plan A. It should okay. never be your plan A. And that's something that you do need to discuss as a company, that um, you, you should be planning to defend against the attack, not to planning to defend uh, what you're going to do if the attack's su successful. It's part of the puzzle, but again, it should not be your plan A. And I think a lot of the insurers are actually reacting to the changes in the landscape because we did see um, e even recently there was um, um, still some discussions about the NotPetya attacks from years ago about what cyber insurers are doing and whether or not they should pay out for something that is a nation state related attack as well. So I think um, it, cyber insurance world has become much more complex, but I think for companies at large, if you're, if you're finding that cyber insurance is your plan A, you really need to go back to the board and think about it again. Okay, I think we've got maybe just one more question. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, what about this one? The one that's been voted the most, right? So uh, with account takeover risks, there you are. It's a long one. With account takeover risks being more prominent, what are the recommended measures to mitigate this aspect given the SMAC OTP, one-time password, is easily compromised? Yeah, I'll take that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I, I think this is a very good question, and this, yeah. is, this is an issue that is um, today facing the industry. So it's here uh, where I think it becomes critical to be able to leverage uh, capabilities like I talked about, and this is a layered approach. You, you have device fingerprinting, you're using things like behavior biometrics. So just in, in this particular context, when someone fishes your credentials and has access to your user ID and password, if you have a digital DNA built of the user, which, a lot of, which technologies are able to do today, which is a combo of your device, of your behavior, of your location, threat, malware, and so on, um, then what happens is even though a person or a fraudster has access to your user ID and password, when they come on to an ecosystem like this, which has layered intelligence for authentication, they will be caught out. And I'm talking about, when I talk about behavior biometrics, I'm talking about muscle memory. So the way I use my muscles is different from the way Phil uses his muscles. And this is inherent in him. The way I use my muscles is inherent in me. So it's unique to us. It's not possible for a fraudster to try and replicate the way I use my muscles or the way Phil uses his muscles. So even if your credentials get compromised, you know, over the dark web or through phishing, that is not enough for someone to then go in and take over your account. So these are some of the um, capabilities that exist today and technologies that exist today 
that banks can leverage to avoid account takeovers and um, help their customers stay safe. Thank you, Namoretta. So we are now out of time officially, right? So thank you very much from everyone here to listening to this. And thank you to the experts here. We only just scratched this very important subject. So Namoretta, thank you. Phil, uh, Thierry, and Teresa. Oh, we're up early in the morning in the UK. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, uh, I'd like to say thank you to all. Cheers. Take thank care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.